published in The Lancet. It's called Community Transmission and Viral Load Kinetics of the SARS-CoV-2 Delta B.1.617.2 variant in vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals in the UK, a prospective longitudinal cohort study. So we're going to say a few things about this, but let me just um, go right here first. Interpretation. Vaccination reduces the risk of Delta variant infection and accelerates viral clearance. Nonetheless, fully vaccinated individuals with breakthrough infections have peak viral load similar to unvaccinated cases and can efficiently transmit infection in household settings, including to fully vaccinated contacts. Host virus interactions early in infection may shape the entire viral trajectory. So I may have my screen back, Zachary. Thank you, sweetie. Um, additional takeaways from this work before we talk about what um, what this means. Um, there's two other pieces of work that they cite, uh, which I was not aware of. Uh, they cite work out of Singapore, which found that only 8% of COVID cases in unvaccinated people were with the Delta variant, whereas the Delta is representing nearly all the COVID cases among the vaccinated. Uh, oh, that's fascinating. Right. That's fascinating. Um, apparently, households are indeed the site of most SARS-CoV-2 transmission globally. And you know, we've been. We, this has been one of our drumbeats from the beginning. You're, you're sending sick people home to their to their families where they can and probably will infect them. Well, yes, that is that is what the policy has been, and apparently that is the site at which most of the, when it has been looked at, where are people getting sick? Most people are getting sick from COVID in their homes from other people in their homes. But with regard to the present study, two additional uh, two additional results are that. Peak viral load did not differ by vaccination status or variant type, okay, but did increase modestly with age. So again, something that suggests, um, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> possibly why um, why people may be getting sicker as they are older when they are infected with COVID. And finally, to a, a question about which I want to spend a little bit more time, in the present study, they found that the risk of infection increased with time in the two to three months since the second dose of the vaccine. So let me just say that again. Um, and also, let's, let's just point out that um, it, across every study that I've seen and all of the public health pronouncements, the numbers are being juked in so many ways. Um, but one of the ways is that you're not you're not called fully vaccinated until you are two weeks out from your final from your final jab. And that means that a whole lot of stuff can happen in those first in those first two weeks. And indeed in the, you know, not the first two weeks, in the, you know, in the first you know, month or more between the moment that you have your first shot, if it's an mRNA shot for which you're expected to have two, and after um, the two weeks after you've got your second one. And so none of the things that happen to you in that time um, do you fall into vaccinated status. Um, so that's that's one thing. Um, so we have this firm set point that has been uh, that has been handed to us without any explanation as to why, um, that you are only considered fully vaccinated um, two weeks after. Um, and what these people, what these researchers find is that uh, in two to three months, within two to three months, your immunity is waning, which is to say your risk of infection is rising. So this raises questions again, again and again and again for me about what it means to be vaccinated, right? Um, if you're losing immunity two to three months after your after your final uh, vaccine. At what moment really can you claim to be fully vaccinated? We've got this this beginning set point, this beginning point, and no one's told us an end point. We're now being encouraged to do boosters if you've already had your first ones. But um, it's illegitimate to have a start point and no end point. You know, really, after two or three months now, we have we are seeing in this study and across many studies um, that you're simply not as protected as as you were. And so what does it even mean to be fully vaccinated? And let me just say before before you we jump in here, I want to consider um, the rabies vaccine and our experience with the rabies vaccine. We were vaccinated with against rabies uh, in the '90s when you were doing a lot of bat work, and I this was. This is a prophylactic vaccine. Yes. That, you, that you get if you think you may encounter rabies. So people like veterinarians get it. Right. Veterinarians and I mean, vaccine work. is prophylax. Um, right. There's. An inoculation that you get famously if you've contracted rabies, if you have right. contacted rabies. But that's not a vaccine. Yeah. Right. So we were, we, we both sought out the rabies vaccine uh, in the 90s when you were working with bats and I was um, working with you sometimes. Actually, I'm not technically certain that uh, what you get after 
uh, contact with rabies isn't a vaccine. I will have to look into its exact mechanism, and then I think it's a, it's not a simple question. But it may be, it may be that you're right, and I just don't okay. know. Okay, um, I don't semantically to me. Vaccine suggests prophylaxis, which is to say before exposure. But perhaps this is perhaps this is not right. So we were both uh, we were both vaccinated against rabies in the '90s, and at the time they told us, you know, we said, okay, is this lifelong? Because some of the some of the vaccines you get are considered um, lifelong. And they said, you know, maybe um, in ten years or so, if you're still doing the work that is putting you at risk of exposure, uh, then you should consider getting your titers checked. So like tetanus. Tetanus, like tetanus, where a ten-year right, and and indeed a lot of these things, which are actually childhood vaccines, at the point that you are an adult, you may get your last shot, and they will say, um, you know, in ten years you'll be due again. This is true for yellow fever as well. Again, like, you know, yellow fever and rabies being vaccines that you know we're vaccinated against, um, but most most people aren't because most people, most weird people, most people in the U.S., for instance, don't go to places where they will be exposed to the to the pathogen. Um, but we had our titers checked ten years on, and our our titers happened to be fine, so we never. Ever got um, a booster, but the idea of a booster ten years on makes some sense because immunity will wane, and um, there are a lot of things that your immune system is doing. And if it hasn't been exposed to the pathogen in question in ten years, um, then maybe it has. Maybe your body has lost some of its immunity. The idea of a vaccine um, that is um, effective only against some variants and not very effective against uh, against Delta even at the beginning and begins to lose its efficacy within two or three months of being so-called vaccinated raises for me the question of what counts as a vaccine at this point. Yeah, th this is, first of all, they are playing on the lack of biological sophistication of the public. Right. The public does know more or less in some vague sense what an antibody is, and therefore it can understand something like what a titer is, and it can understand these things as a proxy. But the idea that what's being generated by these vaccines, and we can argue about whether or not that's even a fair term in light of the mechanism right. of action, but what they are um, producing is B cell immunity. They're producing antibodies. What we want is we want T cell immunity. And so we are seeing the failure. And again, these are a technological marvel mm -hmm. that doesn't make them safe, right? They're technological mar marvel. They do work to some extent, but basically, you and know, they are, in your words, they're a prototype. They're a prototype. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the other term, which I think we haven't used yet, uh, I, I say this as somebody who, um, I've done less of it recently, but I used to tinker and invent things. And there's a stage called proof of concept, mm. right? Yeah. Where you have some object that took you so long to build that it can't possibly be regarded as a, as a success in terms of solving the problem it's targeted at, but it does prove that the problem can be solved. So you having produced this, you know, monstrosity uh, will be delighted as its inventor that yes, the problem is solvable and I've figured out step one of how to do it, but it's not something you could bring to market or you would inflict on somebody, right? And this is what we've got is we've got Proof that you can vaccinate against this disease at what cost in terms of risk to a person and to what level of effectiveness, immunity that wanes at this level. We're basically dealing with something that's the analog of the gamma globulin shots that yeah. people used to get for, maybe they still do get. Uh, for malaria, where you know you yeah. can get some antibodies that will you know probably gum up the malaria if it gets into your system, but it only like you know, but because you're not producing them, it, it's a it's a very short lived kind of protection. I think the first time that we traveled into the tropics, we got we got the gamma globulin. I've certainly had it. Yeah. I can't and then, remember and then when. it was prophyl it was different prophylaxis, including chloroquine. Right, yeah. um, but the. Uh, the fact of this, so first of all, this game, and you're right about the juking of the stats. In yeah. some sense, this pandemic has a meta pandemic of fraudulent accounting that mm. goes with it. The idea that there's any debate at all about what vaccinated means, who the unvaccinated are, or what does it mean to be fully vaccinated? No, no. Yeah. Are you vaccinated? Well, 
did somebody put a needle in your arm and inject the stuff? You're vaccinated. To the extent that the vaccines... Are you protected? Right. Different question. Right. Are you immunized? Maybe we could use that term Mm -hmm. and we could say, actually, you're not immunized until weeks out, but you're vaccinated. Uh, But if we start talking about immunity, then we're not just going to have to also talk about acquired immunity from actually having survived COVID, but also especially if there does turn out to be this causal link between vitamin D deficiency and COVID, if your vitamin D levels are sufficient, don't you kind of have immunity to COVID? And, uh, you know, it's not perfect. Right. It's not perfect, but then neither are the vaccines. There is no perfect solution here. Right. And, you know, we have many categories and, you know, Garrett Vandenbosch uh, is focused on innate immunity, which is different than natural immunity. Natural immunity being generated in response to the disease, innate immunity being the kind of immunity that mostly protects most of us from most things most of the time, right? It's the kind of immunity that you have that- You mean innate versus acquired in the in the immune system sense, as opposed to, I just used, maybe, maybe I confused the terminology by saying acquired by which I'm I don't from think, from a disease. I think you got it right. I no, think I, the, I know I got it, but I think I think that you just spoke in a way that was maybe confusing. Well, let's put it this way. I think to the lay person's ear, innate and natural immunity sound alike, and they refer to two different things, mm-hmm. right? So the fact that uh, kids fend off this disease pretty well, Gerd Vandenbosch at least uh ascribes to their innate immunity. And the point is these systems interact. So at the point that you're buying uh, vaccine-based immunity, you may be buying it at some cost to innate immunity, and you may be compromising the system's ability to generate natural immunity because of something called uh, uh, original antigenic sin. Mm -hmm. Right, original antigenic sin, sin meaning that when your immune system has seen a pathogen, it already is part, it becomes trained on the path for the solution, which means that to the extent that some other solution might be better, it's not available because the immune system is like, ah, I got this one. I know. It's canalized. Right. It becomes becomes canalized. Exactly. Um, And so anyway, all of these things trade off against each other. And in a healthy environment, we would have people hard at work at figuring out what those trade-offs were and for whom it was worth making that gamble. By healthy environment, you mean a healthy scientific and political environment. Right. And a scientific and political environment in which doctors and scientists were free to say what they were seeing, to say what they thought it meant and why, and to fight it out right? Honorably. And we don't live in that environment at all. We live in an environment where we've been told the answer and we are going to have people insist on that answer. And what's more, they're going to demonize anybody who says, wait a minute, I know that answer isn't right. And here's how, Mm -hmm. right? Those people become uh, villains. And you know who else becomes villains? The unvaccinated, even if the unvaccinated have complied and had a vaccine, right? That has to do with the fraudulent way that that term is being used. Right. The idea that you're fully vaccinated at the point that you're weeks out from your second vaccination rather than at the point that you have complied means that we've created this phony category. People who have complied but remain vulnerable because the vaccines are a disappointment are being shoved into this other mythological category in order that they can be demonized. So people will rush toward the vaccine opposite. But yes, well, people who've who've complied Mm -hmm. are being demonized in the data. They're being claimed to have resisted the vaccine and that's why they're safe. And that's why they're they're sick, right? To the extent that somebody who is one week out from their second vaccination mm-hmm. come down, comes down with the disease and then they show up in a data set as unvaccinated and sick with COVID, it ah, sounds like- Those this, are the people you're talking about. Right, those okay. people sound like they have been resistant and not done what they were asked to do. And that's why they're sick. When in fact, the reason that they're sick is that there's an immunological process that has to unfold. Mm -hmm. And that in fact, I mean, if you think about it, the way that this works, the disease itself and your first vaccination cause the development of immunity. At the point that you are vaccinated again, that immunity interacts with your vaccine right? It cannot help but do so to the extent that the second time you get vaccinated with one of these things, some new crop of cells starts putting out the antigen. The cells that are built to recognize that antigen will do that. And they will start bonding to the antigen, either sticking off the surface of these cells that are now making it or floating around because the anchoring domain didn't work. And the point is that is going to have an effect on how immune you actually are at that moment if you encounter a person sick with COVID. So, you know, this isn't 
this is straightforward, right? This problem exists. What is its effect on a person's actual level of protection? And what advice should we therefore give them? And how should they show up in a table that tells us where so you're protected and where you're not? This feels very, very abstract. What advice we should give them in part is immediately after vaccination, you're actually at particular risk. Um, that, that That is actually the moment when you should be most careful not to be exposed uh, to the disease. Right. And we, uh, we, we give no such advice, right? We at best say something like you're not fully protected till rather than you're actually in a special state 